sites so this is this is your paradise here this indoor cage and uh, I don't know facility what do we call it here where we're standing now well, this is the cage I mean this is this is where I don't, I don't want to call it surgery happens but we we stay on top of the mechanics their work their moves and make adjustments to what we saw in batting practice um, and then see if they can go out and repeat it so you know it, it's it's really important, especially when we have a bunch of new guys to the organization, to get to know them, build relationships, ask questions, have conversations about, you know, key things for them, things that make them good, things that adjustments they have to make when things start to go south. And you know, this is this is where those conversations happen, where we got more time. It's interesting. I think we think about the major league guys, and that's fine because you're going to see them every day. But you are meeting guys at the beginning of all this. Do you work them in here to get a baseline? Is this almost like you want to see them before you talk to them? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I like to do, you know, maybe two, three, four days of watching and asking questions. It's, you know, I don't I don't want them thinking about anything other than what they do, what they've been working on in the off season, because a lot of guys, you know, I watch video on everybody that's coming down here before we get here. It's game video, but you start to see who they are when you watch them in the cage and how they work and so their routine whatever that is and you know once you have the conversations after a few days you see their BP you know you gotta got a good idea of what questions to ask and maybe some adjustments to think about it's amazing the more things change though you talk about video and everything else but the more they stay the same it seems especially when you talk about the, the little nuances of hitting yeah there's the, the swings changed a lot. Swing thoughts have changed a lot over the years. There's been a huge evolution to, to hitting just due to the, the analytics and the ability to measure movements and hand speed and you know the exit velocities and all of that. It's, uh, it's pretty cool all the tools that we have. A lot of, a lot of old school type guys you know can kind of freak out about it, but I, I like using it because it's it's real real time measurements that help us to make adjustments in here to help them in the game. But the drills I'm watching right now, Matt Olson's right in front of us going through it. The drills mm -hmm. are pretty much all the same, are they not? Nah, the, 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 there's a lot of, I mean, there's probably about 50 different drills that right. guys will do. Um, you know, it depends on the adjustments guys need to be focused on with what will break down in their swing. And that's what creates the, the menu of drills that each guy will use and focus on based on you know things that they have a tendency to to have go south all right but i gotta ask in the 80s if you walked in a cage i'm watching austin and i'm watching matt both are doing something with literally one hand mm -hmm. they're not was that a thing back then no 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 i, I mean there were some guys who did some one hand stuff but you know rarely was it with a short bat rarely was it uh, very controlled i played with uh, julio franco and he he swung a 35 ounce bat and he would do one hand stuff on some side toss down on the knob with his bottom hand and top hand and it was like oh my gosh how's he strong enough to even do that but you know he was he was special but that you know, there weren't a lot of guys that I saw do one-hand stuff back in the day. Yeah, the other thing, too, is I see Jim Bordogno is out here with bats. Mm -hmm. It's choose your weapon day. What's it like when a young guy actually gets a chance to grab a, a real nice piece of wood you know, that he might not have had? I mean, it, it's it's changed a lot. I, I feel like minor league guys have pretty good bats already. Okay. So, you know, the, the quality of the wood, the finish, you know the balance uh, there's a lot of a lot of more there's a lot more technology that goes into manufacturing the batch for each guy it's specialized there was a pretty cool article that came out on austin you know at marucci and what they have the ability to do and i'm just like thank god somebody else gets to do that there ain't no way i want to do it well you look like he was in a marvel movie mm -hmm. they had right. all sort of Hooked up Wired to a bunch up, of stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It looked like green screen. Yeah, very cool. I mean, that's that's a part of the technology that I'm talking about to help these guys be the best they can be. How extreme does it have to get? Have you made many suggestions about changing a bat for a guy, or is that even sort of hands off? You know, sometimes, you know, I've probably had a handful of conversations in my years about just size. You know, the 
the weight and and what the what that will do with the hand speed, the balance, you know. So, but these guys know what they want, what they feel. Not often is does that come up. It's normally later in the season where the bat they use the first half is maybe feeling a little bit heavier and slower, and so. I may suggest, you know, what do you think about dropping an ounce or something like that? Kevin Seitzer is uh, here with us. Uh, we're in his palace, the uh, the hitting cage down here at uh, spring training. Uh, he brought up Austin Riley and the bats, and he's also working. I'm sure other players are with mental health coaches as well. When did that? When did you notice as a coach that first starting? You know, it, it's it's been around for a long time. I mean, you know, it, it's for me, it's something that. We do a lot of that here in the cage as well, but they have the ability to maybe dig in even deeper because there's a there's a lot of issues that I've noticed in hitters that can stem from the way they were raised, you know, maybe getting beat up a little bit from a coach or a dad or, you know, that was hard on them and, you know, you see them battling the confidence and you know, maybe some insecurities with wanting to change things when something doesn't feel right all the time. And, you know, we don't really go there until we get a really, really good relationship. And, you know, it, it, it's something that you have to just walk softly and be careful. But for me, it's every hitter's got, I'll say, quote unquote, issues little demons that they battle, you know, you're not strong enough, you can't hit the ball hard enough or far enough, you gotta try harder, you don't wanna let them come inside and jam you, you gotta be quick in there. There's there's all these little, you know, negative thoughts that they feel like are good thoughts that you wanna, you wanna be able to address those. And it, you know, 90% of what happens in here with all hitters is happening between the ears to be able to make the moves that they need to make and and be as consistent as what they can with their swing. So that's what we try and do. We just try and clean up anything that can get in the way and everybody's different. So I'm, I'm looking in the box here and there's you know, some of the tools of the trade. Is the donut ever gonna make its way back to the game? Well, we have a different kind of donut. You know, there's like, it's a, a sleeve that goes over the back. That's not a donut. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> probably not a donut. Was there ever a time where you couldn't get out of the on-deck circle, a donut wouldn't come off? I don't want to age and everything. You didn't, you didn't use, use a donut? donut. No. Sorry, my bad. I used I a I used a metal, big metal pole to, to kind of get loose a little bit, and then I just swung my back. So, did I wasn't a donut guy. Did I just ate you a little bit more than I should have? You no. weren't a donut guy? No, I, I'm, I'm not terribly old, but I'm pretty old. <laughs> so, because the, the on-deck circle used to have nothing. Guys would take a knee and they'd watch a little bit now. Yeah. For a while there, there was the heavy bat, there was the metal pole, there was the sleeve donut. Mm -hmm. um, why can't we just go back to the good old-fashioned for me, it's whatever they need to be ready. That's all I care about. What What do you want in that on deck circle to be ready mentally to get after it? So, hey, with I, all the pollution you talk about that can be in a guy's head, what about the clock now? That's That's going to be another adjustment that guys are going to have to make. I think it'll be challenging the first couple weeks, a few weeks. I'm glad we get to use it in spring training, yeah. so we can kind of get a little bit more used to it and synced up with it but it's just going to be from a hitting standpoint they just have to stay ready because everybody pitchers got the ability to come whenever it's legal to come and that could be quick that could be longer holds uh, there's there's all kinds of little things that that can that can change and as long as the hitters in the box and ready It'd be all right. Which guy benefits the most with the shift going away on this team? <sighs> Good question. I would say all of them, <laughs> you know, but now Maddie hit a lot of balls to the pull side that were caught in right field. Albie's the same way. Although Albie's got a lot of hits that he would hit softly in that four hole that the second baseman was too far back and he would beat him out. But you know, I, I'd say probably Olsen would be the guy who would benefit the most, just off the top of my head. For those that don't know, you're in Kansas City as a player. George Brett's there, Bill Jackson's there. What is their routine like? I, I would imagine you got a guy that 
I don't want to say grips it and rips it, but I mean, that's just natural talent there, isn't it, when you bring up those two? Yeah, I mean, our, our routines were batting practice. We didn't have cages to where we would go every day and, and do routines in the cage. We, we used the cage whenever it was raining outside and we couldn't take batting practice. Or we'd go to the cage when we were, you know, feeling a little jacked up with our swing. We had a machine in there and we'd get some extra swings off of that. But, you know, there wasn't a ton of cage work, but, you know, those guys, the, the focus was what they were trying to do in batting practice, you know, with their approach, staying in the middle of the field. George was always trying to hit the ball in the middle of the field the other way, never thought about pulling the ball, um, wanted to work on his swing path to, to stay inside and stay tension free, you know, some a lot of the stuff that we're still focused on. but. You know, it didn't happen in the cage back in the day. It happened in batting practice. Yeah, Freddie Freeman was sort of yes. second base and over. Hit the ball to shortstop. Right. That was it. Ground ball to shortstop because he had that tendency to loop and to be too quick because he's got really quick hands. So that was his approach. Every pitch, every at bat, every swing in batting practice, every swing in the cage, he was trying to hit a ground ball to the shortstop. And, you know, and then we'd make adjustments from there with his mechanics if it ever needed to happen, which didn't very often. Were you a foul line to foul line guy in BP? Did you sort of... I was middle the other way in BP. Okay. I, I didn't worry about pulling the ball. I would pull home runs once in a while, but, you know, it wasn't... It, it normally wasn't on purpose unless I was mad, you know, and then that usually didn't work out very good after that in the game. So, you know, it, but my emphasis with these guys is stay foul line to foul line, stay in the middle of the field for the most part. We work on, you know, first round, stay in middle oppo with seven swings, and then we do a situational round where we're moving runners, we got hit and run, get him over, infield back, infield in. You work on situational type of bats and it's you know they can do it real easily with batting practice but for me it's just a matter of constantly having the mindset of what the swing's supposed to look like with the situation last one visualization were you a guy who night before day of you know who's pitching would you literally close your eyes are you trying to vision envision ab's no i would i would uh I always remembered what guys looked like, and so once I knew them, it was it was there and it was ready. The only time, you know, I had broken bones, I had torn hamstrings and torn quads and calves and all of that. And when I was going to miss time, I would do visualization of a bats just to, to stay sharp, like I was having the same timing and, and all of that, just so I'd stay ready whenever I got healthy, which helped a lot. Kevin, we appreciate the time. Thanks all for right. letting us uh, inside of uh, your lair. For lack you're of a better term. you're welcome. It. All right. Kevin Seitzer, Braves hitting coach with us here on the fan.